Hello and welcome to Wealthy at Home. We are the slow reading virtual book club that alternates works by Wealthy with works by authors connected to Wealthy in some way. And I'm so excited that we're starting a new series today on Eudora Wealthy's 1941 collection of short stories titled A Curtain of Green and Other Stories. During this series, we are going to read and discuss three stories each week between now and February 12th, and we are going to take a winter break from December 25 to January 15th. Today, we will be discussing the introduction by Catherine Ann Porter as our piece number one. This was the introduction that was originally published in the 1941 edition of A Curtain of Green. And we're also going to discuss Lily Daw and the, and the Three Ladies and a piece of news. I'm Jessica Russell, director of the Eudora Welty House and Garden, and I am grateful to our friend, Suzanne Mars. She is Eudora Welty's friend and Eudora Welty's biographer, and she is Professor, Emilsap, uh, Professor Emerita at Millsaps College, and she is leading these discussions once again. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And just some housekeeping. To comment or to ask a question, click the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and select raise hand. If you're on a tablet or a phone, you may have to actually tap the screen for that option to appear. Um, but that's how you get our attention. And a lively discussion also takes place in the chat. Sometimes members will uh, even share links and resources. And speaking of, I'm going to kick us off with a couple links from some members who have been participating. Uh, this Wealthy at Home has cultivated such a nice community. So um, just to kick us off, I got a really nice link from Jubair. He has a link from the Library of Congress featuring Eudora Wealthy reading three of her short stories, one of which is Lily Doll and the Three Ladies, which is part of our selection today. And Marsha Huff has shared um, some resources related to why I live at the PO in a worn path, which aren't part of our discussion today. Today, but are part of this um, larger book that we'll be, we will be discussing in this series. So I'll put those in the chat. And um, that said, Suzanne, shall we begin today's discussion? Yeah, I'm so glad to see everyone again and to be back talking about Eudora Wealthy. Let me just give you a little bit of background about this book and about the uh, role Catherine Ann Porter played in the book, and then we'll start our discussion. Uh, at age uh, 29, Eudora Welty met Catherine Ann Porter, then in her 50s, uh, and then married to Albert Erskine, the business manager at the Southern Review in Baton Rouge. She would go on to be Eudora's agent much later on when she wrote Losing Battles um, and uh, uh, be her editor. Uh, he was editor-in-chief at Random House. Uh, Porter had invited Eudora to visit in Baton Rouge. Uh, she was really shy about doing so, but she finally did. And I think it was Cleanth Brooks and his wife Tinkum who accompanied uh, Eudora to Porter's house, but I'm not sure about that. So if anyone knows, uh, let us know. But I think she didn't drive over with them, but she went with them uh, to see uh, Porter. Uh, Porter, a bit later, recommended Eudora's work to Ford Maddox Ford, who attempted to obtain book publication for her stories. He died in November uh, in 1939, in the fall of 1939, uh, and Eudora was ever grateful to him for his efforts. In November of 1939, a stroke of great good fortune for Eudora Welty, John Woodburn of Doubleday, came through Jackson on a talent scouting expedition. And Eudora and her mother entertained him at their house and her mother fed him waffles for breakfast. And he took some of Eudora's stories with him back to New York. And uh, he wrote her from New York saying, I knew it was all gonna be all right as soon as I tasted your mother's waffles. So that was the beginning of a very important uh, professional connection and friendship. Uh, he also, uh, in New York, recommended that a young agent just starting his business, a young agent named Dermot Russell, the son of George William Russell, A.E., uh, contact Eudora Welty and see if uh, she might like to hire him as her agent. And he wrote her and said, I'd like to be your agent. And she wrote back and said, great, be my agent. And he wrote back and said, look, you better check me out before you going doing this and that was the beginning of a wonderful uh friendship lifelong uh friendship uh for dermot until dermot died uh 
Dermot immediately, uh, by the summer of 1940, was hard at work uh, trying to place Eudora's stories in major magazines. They had been mostly in little journals uh, because that would give John Woodburn the ammunition to obtain a book contract for her uh, at Doubleday. And uh, by uh, January 1941, he had placed both a Warren Path and Powerhouse at the Atlantic. And in very short order, Eudora was awarded a book contract. And while she was still under contract, he also placed Twy Live at the P.O. at the Atlantic and The Key at Harper's Bazaar. A visit of charity appeared in Decision and Clyde in the Southern Review, and then all of her stories had had periodical publication before the book came out. In February 1941, Catherine Ann Porter agreed to write an introduction, uh, an introduction that she anticipated would increase the book sales by about $10,000. I don't know if she was uh, being grandiose in that uh, thought or not. But anyway, both Dermot Russell and John Woodburn were thrilled that Catherine Ann Porter was going to write the introduction to the book. Uh, she asked Eudora what the deadline was, and Eudora said she didn't know, when she, and Eudora would never push her about this. And so Porter took her time and uh, was very slow to get it finished. And it was not until late, late August of 1941 that she finished uh, the introduction, and by that time it delayed the publication of the book by about two months. Uh, Eudora was at Yaddo with uh, Porter for two months in the summer, and Woodburn would write her and say, you know, see if you can't, in a nice way, just urge her on. But Eudora didn't want to urge Catherine Ann Porter to write an introduction to her book when she was working on her own fiction, so she wouldn't, she wouldn't do it. And she didn't really aid in that process. The book was published on November 7th, 1941. It got a great review in the New York Times book review. Maureen Hauser, few contemporary books have ever impressed me quite as deeply as this book of stories by Eudora Welty. It seems to me almost impossible to discuss her work detachedly. Reading it twice has not given me any critical distance, but has only drawn me closer into its rich and magic world. To explain just why these stories impress one so so appears as difficult as to define why an ordinary face encountered by chance in the street might suddenly reveal miraculous beauty through a smile, perhaps, or through an unexpected expression of sadness. So uh, a rave review in the New York Times, other good reviews uh, as well. The Let me give you the order of composition of the story so we can think about that, and then I'll give you the order of publication, separate publication. Then we'll talk about the work. In 1936, Eudora published Death of a Traveling Salesman, Flowers for Marjorie, and Petrified Man. In 1937, A Piece of News, A Memory, Lily Daw and the Three Ladies, and perhaps she wrote, she didn't publish them then, she, uh, this is the order of composition she wrote them. She perhaps wrote an early version of The Key. In 1938, she wrote Old Mr. Grenada, which would become Old Mr. Marble Hall, Keela the Outcast Indian Maiden, The Whistle, A Curtain of Green, and Why I Live at the P.O. In 1939, The Hitchhikers, and in 1940, A Visit of Charity, The Key, Clyde, Powerhouse, and A Warm Path. They were published in this order, 1936, Death of a Traveling Salesman, 1937, Lily Daw, A Piece of News, Flowers for Marjorie, A Memory, 1938, Old Mr. Grenada, A Curtain of Green, and The Whistle, 1939, Petrified Man and the Hitchhikers, 1940, Keela the Outcast Indian Maiden, and 1941, Powerhouse, A Worn Path, Why I Live at the Keo, P.O., The Key, A Visit of Charity, and Clyde. So, uh, well, think about what I want to do is think about the order of the story. So there's the order of composition, the order of publication. Now let's think of the order that Eudora Wealthy puts the stories in as we go through here and talk about that. We'll probably talk about that more after we've finished, but we can talk about it along the way uh, as well. 
Okay, does anyone have anything they want us to talk about in the introduction by Catherine Ann Porter to start off with? Um, I don't want to spend too much time here, but let's spend a little time and then we'll go to the stories. And anyone have anything they want to address in the introduction? Marsha? Well, I can't hear you yet. Okay, here. Well, yeah. my statement, I just want to say something that must have been obvious to everyone. I don't think Catherine Ann Porter understood Eudora Welty's stories. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I and I stopped reading the part where she was going to talk about individual stories toward the end there, because after what she said about why I live at the PO and apparently dementia precox is now called schizophrenia. I mean, I just think she just didn't get it. Uh, well, I think you're you're exactly right. I think some of the things I think she's, you know, closer to the mark, but that one wildly uh, off the mark. Let's go to Monica and Harriet and then Beverly. Monica. Well, I just taught a class in Catherine Ann Porter's short fiction, so I'm feeling more charitable towards her than I normally do because her writing is so gorgeous. But I just, I started counting the number of times she used the word child. Um, I just started getting really um, defensive about how she kept in, in uh, insisting on, she was so unschooled, untrained, so childlike that all of those characterizations really bug me. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. She doesn't need to travel. She's not travel. Well, this is somebody who's lived in New York, uh, who's been to Mexico, who's uh, uh, you know, not uh, uh, isolated Gordon? in the, in the way that she said. So there, there is that as well. Uh, yeah, I think she saw her as her discovery and she's wants to make that point and is Albert Erskine's discovery. So there's no mention in here of Robert Penn Warren or Cleanth Brooks, the editors of the Southern Room, but there is mention of Albert Erskine who, and Eudora loved Albert Erskine, but I don't think that, uh, I think he gets too much credit. Uh, Porter would very in short order, not want to give him very much credit any for anything, but uh, at this point she still was, I think. Monica, be sure and correct me anything I get wrong about Catherine Ann. Okay, Harriet. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think that, um, Catherine gets a lot of things wrong. Uh, I think that she gets one thing right, which is that Eudora Welty had something to be modest about this collection of stories. Uh, I really do love this collection of stories and think about them as kind of story puzzles that are full of innovation, uh, and female swerve. Uh, and doing wonderful things with literary convention uh, that are, is terribly original. Um, but I think that Catherine Anne, uh, you know, I think that in the setup, she sort of describes herself as someone who's traveled in foreign countries and has a had spiritual and intellectual exile, uh, as opposed to um, uh, this uh, Miss Welty, uh, who was born and brought up in Jackson, where her father was president of a Southern insurance company, uh, where um, she had at her arm's reach typical books, uh, typical collection of books that existed as a matter of course in a certain kind of Southern family uh, that um, she had tried a job or two uh, because that seemed the next thing, uh, but um, uh, had no real need of a job and so settled down to writing. Um, the condescension uh, here uh, and the sense of... Um, of uh, of acolyte and mentor uh, is really strong. And I, when she gets to the point where she talks about uh, Eudora never having been schooled, never having had a mentor who to discuss literary um, problems with, uh, I have to be grateful that although Catherine Anne was important to Eudora and the friendship, you know, was largely intact uh, over many decades, um, it, 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 she didn't play the kind of role that um, that Carolyn Gordon did for uh, uh, Flannery O'Connor, that's to step in and try and meddle with her writing. Uh, and uh, I have to be grateful for that uh, because I don't think it would have uh, been helpful. Um, but um, but yeah, it's an interesting piece, and it's full of the the charm of Catherine and Porter's writing. But it's also full of stuff that is uh, makes us raise our eyebrows and wonder um, uh, how wrong she could be. Yeah, I mean, Eudora 
was looking for a job and she took all kinds of jobs and uh and the family was not uh devastated by the depression but they also were not uh, uh flourishing they need mrs welty was trying to uh, earn money as well so uh, so I think she's wrong there. She says that Eudora loved painting, and of course she did paint, but I, she never sought a career as a painter that I know of. Um, and um, so there are these kind of distortions and, uh, uh, yeah, and some condescension. I also think some of the writers, she mentioned two Russian writers. I would have said Turgenev and Chekhov, not Tolstoy and Dostoevsky as shaping Eudora Welty more. But anyway, there you are, Beverly and then Laura. Well, what I would say is is to just second what has been said. I, when I started reading this, I felt it was very, very condescending. And I thought that maybe, you know, she, maybe she was jealous. Maybe that was part of, of the problem. But the, I had the same reaction that Marsha had, that she's calling Stella Rondo a schizophrenic. I'm assuming that's the person mm -hmm. she's speaking of um and um you know I, Catherine Ann Porter at the time was more famous than Eudora Welty certainly but I think she missed the mark on um, many of the comments that she made about the stories and I thought her whole attitude about the the as Monica mentioned her age you know that she was young and and she was a girl and all of that. I thought she was really just very, very condescending. And it made me mad. And she's been dead a long time. And Eudora's been dead a long time. But I'm still mad about it. Now, I will <laughs> say Eudora was loyal, absolutely loyal to oh, Catherine. Wow. And the only person I know that she ever kicked out of her house was uh, the biographer of Catherine Ann Porter because she thought she was <laughs> not doing right by her. So, um, I mean, she didn't give her the boot, but she suggested, I know way that she leave yeah Laura that's really interesting that was one of my main questions is what what did Welty think of Catherine Ann Porter so this has been really interesting because my eyebrows were like I think permanently raised <laughs> while, while reading this introduction because one it just it felt bitter in a lot of ways um the beginning especially but then I, I started thinking as I read it could we have found, could could someone as opposite to Welty been found? Like, I don't think somebody more opposite than her in so many ways <laughs> could have been found to write the introduction. But anyway, um, I think the one thing though to stand up that I found really interesting was on page 17 when she was talking about realism and the realism mm -hmm. in Welty's writing. And I thought that, that that, and the way that she talked about her sort of, her uh, her eye and her ear and her connection to place. I thought that that, she described it as a as true as a tuning fork. I thought that that was really, really on the mark because it's something that I I've thought about and how she I didn't like the term wealthy's little human monsters, but the sort of let's go with the sort of the people that maybe you wouldn't want to meet in at a party. I don't know the different way she described it, but I thought that that made me really think about the first story, like. Um, and how you brought up the the order of the stories and why start with Lily Da, I guess. That was my question. What she says about dream, the dream sort of reality is also to the point. Let me just say one other thing that I, I do think it's condescending, but it is important to, I think, to, to realize how young Eudora was when she wrote these. I mean, this book is published when she's 32. I don't know about you, but I mean, I still haven't done anything that can compare. And at 32, I wouldn't have even known to what to think about it. <laughs> so um, yeah, Monica. I'm curious now to see and or to know if any of y'all have seen what Porter's like draft actually looked like. Like, do we know, did she take notes when Welty? I, I can't imagine her taking notes when Welty came to visit. So I'm wondering um, if this was written just, you know, I know that this was a difficult time for Porter. I think this is when she was Owed, owed stories to the publisher and wasn't turning them in. So I'm just curious if you know anything about the manuscript development, because that'd be interesting to see. Uh, Eudora's manuscript development? No, Porter's. Like, did Porter just sit down and finally write this down one day when she, when the publisher he was like, no, she, seriously? He said she wrote it in two days. Eudora had sent her a letter, and I have been looking for my copy of that letter. I know I have it, but I can't find it. <laughs> 
And so she had a lot of uh, biographical information in the letter that Porter drew upon. Okay. She said she wrote it in two days in August and then sent it off. So it was done rapid fire. Because yeah. it'd be fascinating then to compare Welty's letter to what her actual yeah. manuscript looked like. And I maybe I can get it from uh, Maryland uh, before we get too much further in, but I could, or maybe I can find it in my files, or maybe somebody has it in their files, but no, uh, that's right. Okay, Joe Ellen. Um, I want to note a little more generally um, Catherine N. Porter's topics. She writes about the literary period within which they find each other and themselves. And if she wrote it in two days, she had set pieces um, almost figured out already. But the defense of the short story form was huge. And Catherine N. N. Porter played a major role in that. Um, she was writing on the brink of modernism, entering the academic world, which really helped the reading of short stories, even if uh, writing or publishing in magazines was drying up. But when she really rails against writers' workshops and that kind of thing, for me, she's really arguing for a kind of organicism, which I think she was known for. She says, you know, no method can be used. You can't be taught. Um, the process has to be more natural. You have to be born to it, all that, all that kind of thing. And there really was a literary politics out of which she was writing here. Yeah, and Eudora was pressed for a novel. And before she was able to place her stories and support her, was right about that. Yeah, yeah. Harriet. We can't hear you, Harriet. Yeah, I, I hadn't started yet, but you couldn't get it off. I I, um, I wanted to pick up on um, the Monica's uh, uh, sense of uh, what did Welty tell her, because that's what I was thinking, too. That is, I wonder um, whether we're listening to a replay of uh things that Eudora would say that were self-deprecating uh that um that turned into this um and uh you know things like um I can imagine her saying that uh uh the photography had been a serious interest of hers and then you and then Catherine and Porter getting it slightly wrong uh and uh and and thinking it's painting uh but um but I was also I also was really struck by the moment when she says that Welty never escaped having a militant social consciousness in the current radical intellectual sense uh, that she was never a professed commun professed never professed communism. You, you know, she, I think she's half half right in that Eudora Welt is not Richard Wright and was never a communist. Uh, but um, uh, but I'm you know struck with. Uh, uh, our history of understanding Eudora's social consciousness uh, and um, and the way in which uh, this sets up a different a different uh, approach to introducing her. In a way, uh, she is echo. Uh, she is stating what Eudora says in different I words in *Must the Novelist Crusade*. And then, uh, so let's talk about that as we talk about the stories. Yeah. Okay, shall we start off with Lily Daw and the Three Ladies? Why do you think this story comes first? What's the first thing you want to say about this story? Anybody want to start us off? So, Lily Daw and the Three Ladies. Monica has her hand raised. Monica. Thank you. I didn't see you there. Well, I love that we start the the first paragraph in this book of her first book. How it starts with the feeble minded, the the Ellisville Institute for the feeble minded of Mississippi, um, okay. which um, you want to talk about all the different discourses of discussing this place or the or mental illness in the South or these places for mental illness in the South. You know, Mab Seacrest's incredible work on. Um, Central State in Milledgeville, home of Flannery O'Connor. Um, so I just find it fascinating that we start with the Ellisville Institute. I say as an email just popped up, I'm actually trying to track down my great great grandmother was a patient in in Brogham, uh, Broughton, in North Carolina. So it's a continuing theme. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the uh, Ellisville, and then the ladies are saying. Lily Dawes getting in at Ellisville, like she's been admitted to Harvard. So she's getting in at Ellisville. Yeah, Susan. Yeah, I mean, one of the things 
I love about this story, and I think it's just such a great way into a collection, is that even though it's called Lily Daw and the Three Ladies, it's really about, I mean, we really are filled with the three ladies and their perspectives and the town's perspective. You know, everybody has something to say about this, you know, and everybody feels um, either inside the decision-making process or wish they were, you know, and the whole, the I mean, even the way the story ends, everybody cheered even though some people think that she's on the train and some people are sure that she's not. I mean, it's really, we're really so focused on that, that community that I think it, it pulls us into a world. Yeah, I think that what we do need to talk for sure is what are the qualities of this community? What is the kind of community in which Lily Daw lives and which is dominated for her by three ladies who are pretty clearly emblems of the fates, aren't they? Here are they, they are her fate. And uh, Mrs. Carson's got a tape measure around uh, and a thimble on her finger, a tape measure around and a thimble on her and, finger. And Something. the Baptist minister's wife and the postmistress. Yes. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's a great, it's a great little group there. Yeah. Uh, Harriet. They're also ladies. Um, and um, what I I I, I want to uh, talk about the comedy uh, of Welty's fiction uh, and um, her play with these ladies, uh, ladies of victory, uh, who uh, take Lily under their protection uh, and have a kind of public forum uh, to discuss um, her choices or their choices. Uh, would her welfare be best served by uh, the protections offered by the state? Uh, in the form of, Ellis, of the Ellisville Institute for the Feeble-Minded, uh, or, or also wayward girls? Um, uh, and uh, Or should she be mainstreamed into marriage with a traveling xylophone player? Uh, what strikes me is how much, you know, Catherine Ann says that Eudora was not, there was nothing autobiographical about Eudora's fiction. Um, uh, I bet Suzanne Morris would disagree with that, but I also, uh, I also think that there, what that 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 what Eudora does have memory of is literary history and its convention, and that we're playing here with the two traditional endings for woman in fiction in 19th and early 20th century, which is marriage or madness, uh, and um, we are uh, looking at um, uh, at uh, what would be. Um, um, uh, marriage, or 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 um, um, what's the word I want? Um, uh, uh, I, I, institutionalization. Um, incarceration. Uh, but what? <laughs> incarceration. But incarceration. Yeah, and and they're presented as 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 in the comedy, they're presented as equally as, as equivalent choices. Um, so here's wealthy looking at the tradition of women in fiction and making fun of um, of the endings uh, for women uh, and also present and the comedy of presenting them somehow as as uh, as interchangeable uh, and um, uh, two different kinds of confinement uh, and uh, and at the end we don't even know for sure which one uh, has come out because after all uh, uh, there there they are uh, equally amusing choices. Yeah, uh, I think it's interesting that it's Mrs. Carson and Mrs. Watts. We know Mrs. Watts is Etta, but it's only Etta once, you know. So they're defined by being Mrs. You know? Right, and, and at one point they say, praise the fathers, um, yeah. I wealthy has them say, yeah. Yeah, and A. May Slocum, A. May, we know that the name, because of your daughter's friend here in Jackson was A. May, so it's, that's will be the pronunciation here. A. May Slocum is, you know, uh, not ex socially acceptable even as the postmistress because she is not married. She's got bumps on her face. So uh, she's unattractive. She's a... Uh, yeah, there's yeah. also a lot of eugenics attitude in here, which is, you know, the idea of of um, of of the, having the danger of having an attractive woman who is uh, stone broke, um, uh, having uh, her maturity on her. Uh, and needing to be 
confined. Um, yeah, it's her sexuality that gets her sent to Ellisville. Otherwise, yeah. she could stay. Yeah. Because yeah. baby um, girls. Amy. Whoops, we can't hear you, Amy. There. Sorry. That's I, right. I grew up not far from there, and I felt like I was walking back home when I started <laughs> reading this because those were choices you needed to find a husband for most people. I, my mother was unusual, but even at my age, you needed... And, and that was so uh, delineated in this. It just, it struck me how clearly. And also the humor of it, because you could be institutionalized where she would be taken care of. And think about the fact that in this time, there were no, um, there were not a lot, not a lot of social conventions, ways of taking care of someone who couldn't take care of themselves. So maybe going to Ellisville, excuse me, we called it going to Ellisville, Going to Ellisville wasn't such a bad deal for someone who could not take care of themselves and make their own decisions. To me, the more scandalous thing was a xylophone player because I knew how that would hit in the South of that time. Um, I mean, that would that would be scandal. So that was the funny part to me as I read it was that she gave him equal billing with, okay, you go to Ellisville or the xylophone player. Yeah. And these women, this, this community was happy for her no matter where she went. That was a beautiful thing to me about this story. They wanted her taken care of. That's what I felt when they I read wanted, it. They wanted her taken care of, but really they wanted her off their hands, didn't they? Oh, uh, yes, 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 and, for sure. And they take care of her. They rescue her from her horrible uh, father who's tried to kill her. But uh, look at the house they give her. They're oh, going yeah. to take care of her. They're going to make sure she gets to Ellisville, but they're only going as far as Jackson. And Amy's wondering, well, what happens when she gets to Ellisville? Somebody right. Gets to Ellisville. So right. They're, they're kind of half-hearted about it, I think. Right. They are. You're right. But they do make sure that she doesn't have to pay for her tickets at the show and that the boys in town are on their honor and so forth and so on. And that she can pick right. up hats at the store. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, and then they just hunt her down to get it back from her, to trade yeah. something, you know. Well, something that's not quite as nice, yeah. Right, yeah. right. Well, my, my daddy was on store, and you did that sometimes with people, yeah. you know, who didn't understand that was a kind thing to do. So. Let's see, G-Bear. <laughs> I have a comment about the light side and a question about the dark side. Uh, on the comedy side, I think you know, I do appreciate and love the humor in this story and reminding of my life in England where we lived in a village. And they said in the village, the village was so, so small they couldn't afford a town idiot, so they had to take turns. And, uh, <laughs> some of that here. But I was wondering if uh, there's any implication that when her father cut her throat, the blood loss might have caused her feebleness. Was that a, you know, that act of violence? Did that put her where she was? I don't know, uh, that, but I think it's a question worth asking, yeah. Pearl. Uh, I just wanted to say when we're talking about the three ladies, um, Aime is the one that is sing, sing, single, uh, yeah. not married, and she is the one that is most empathetic with uh, Lily Dosh. At the end, she's screaming, she's crying, she's trying to get you know, make sure that the man meets with a with um, Lily Daw. And I always find that sort of interesting that you've got these two that are married, they're responsible for the church and the ethics, the morals of the community and so on. Uh, but Aime Slocum as the single one uh, really understands. She almost wishes like, oh, maybe she could meet with that xylophone player. Maybe she could have, <laughs> yeah. a, a have an ending, you know, um, so and, I think- and Aime is the one who uh, notices the hope chest is gone, you know. Right, right. So she's she lost. Yeah. She's excited about it that that she's getting <laughs> Lily's getting out of the town where she's yeah. stuck. <laughs> Beverly. Well, this this reminds me of Flannery O'Connor's story, The Life You Save May Be Your Own, where the old lady and that story actually is willing to trade her daughter 
more or less, to Tom T. Shiflett, who wants the broken down car that he's worked on. And she has to know, the mother has to know that her daughter, whom Flannery O'Connor refers to throughout as it, her idiot daughter, um, is not going to be taken care of. But she lets them ride off in that car. And then, of course, Tom T. Shiflett drops her at the first place they come to and rides on without her. So we have somebody mentally challenged in that story too, but she does not have even her, her own mother who is willing to make sure that she has a community to take care of her. So, you know, we have, we have two similar settings and two similar, of course, you know, the daughter and life you say may be your own. It's not as high functioning as Lily is, but still her mama's, her mama wants to get rid of her. And uh, Mrs. Watts has already said, you know, that marriage would be horrible. It'd be better to send her to Ellisville. But as soon as they spot the man, they get off the train. <laughs> so a change of thought here. You know, yeah, Joe Ellen. Um, first, I just, I can't read the story with about the demonic father and like, and not think of Huckleberry Finn and Aunt Polly and the forces of communication. I'm not going to go down that path particularly, but I really want to think of Lily herself and what we know about her. Um, she seems like the still center of all of this to some extent. We know that she was fascinated by what's called the commotion of the xylophone. Um, Lily does seem to be kind of waiting and still. She likes the um, xylophone player's manner, hello toots, she quotes. Mm -hmm. But then, and that leads her. She she clearly knew she was supposed to be getting married. Um, but, and that gets linked to a hope chest. But what we learn when she's encountered in her home is that she really wants things. She wants gifts. What will you give me? Because she knows that happens when you're getting married, I suppose. And it turns out to be about the hope chest all the, all the time, all along, that she would go to Ellisville with her hope chest or she'd get married with her hope chest. No, and it's and she loses her hope chest. And I do think the story yeah. about a, a person who needs some kind of hope and who has no hope, and mm. hope is the ability to imagine something better. And I, so I always like to say, uh, Eudora Welty used to, I knew, used to know when we were talking if she said so and so has no imagination, that was about the worst thing she could say about a person has no imagination, and. Uh, Lily is in a way being denied the ability to imagine something yeah. better. You know, she's deprived of the hope chest, I think. So yeah, Harriet. So, you know, I'm coming off of uh, working on uh, Welty's interest in crime fiction uh, and her uh, play with it, uh, transformation of, of his plot, of his traditional plots. I, I um, am just, uh, which means that I'm just now um, trans, uh, uh, making a transition to working more on the topic of abuse uh, in, in Eudora's fiction. Where are you going? Hmm? Someone, yes. Someone. Oh, so, oh, so, so I, I, I'm just uh, commenting on the on the presence uh, of female abuse. Uh, in this story, and and I think we can bring it over to um, uh, to other 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 items in this collection. Yeah, and I think we can talk about it in a piece of news. Yeah, as well. Yeah. All right. Anything else about Lolita Monica? Well, I just want to follow up on what Harriet said. One of the most interesting. I, I'm very interested. I love the description of Lily, and I've written about her um, as an ugly woman. Um, but the description that you could see the wavy scar on her throat if you knew it was there, I just find that to be such a uh, an important statement that, you know, it is the women who know to look for it. It is the women, I mean, is, are the only men we have in this story her father and the xylophone player? I mean, part it, of this is the kind of- Norton who has the store. The right. It's, it's so much of this is about like women being the ones who know- things and and look for things and and take care of things and also who can be tyrants anything else last chance on 
Lily Dahl. Anything else about Lily Dahl? Yeah, Pearl. I put a, a note in the chat um, to look up Felice Caserati's uh, painting, The Three Maidens. I'm not good enough on my Mac to put the link in there, but I'm gonna try to turn my, uh, my computer around to show you this picture because it's four ladies. One is called um, um, Violetta, like violent. One is called um, something else. But anyway, the the innocent one is, I think, like a Lily Daw. I don't know. Can you can you see that? Do I have it right? Yes. Yes. And so there's Lily Daw, the naked one, Bianca, and you've got uh, Amy Slocum is in the red there. Anyway, I think um, Jessica or uh, someone put the link in the chat so you can maybe see it. Thank that, you. Uh, that's in Venice at the Casa Pizarro. And it's later than Welty was there. So there's no connection, except I always think of this painting uh, to illuminate Lily Daw. I think the names are, uh, of course, are interesting here. And the name Lily. Mm hmm the white, the Lily the, white Bianca. I can't. The pale, there, <laughs> Lily, the innocent. Um, Watts sounds a, a real charge. Car, son, the mm -hmm. the Baptist preacher, uh, and uh, yeah, A May not not so powerful. Yeah, and the misses, both the misses. Yeah. And these ladies are sort of having an open air picnic in this painting, and they're standing on sort of what looks like a precipice. If they take one step back, they're going off the cliff. Anyway, it's a it's a lovely visual image to go with. Monica, I'm sure you would love this picture. <laughs> Anything else, Lily Daw? Well, let's talk about a piece of news. A piece of news uh, is based, it was sparked in Eudora's mind by an actual incident. And when she was, had just graduated from the University of Wisconsin, she had a friend in Montana whose father ran a newspaper and she went out to visit her. And she, this was at Christmas time between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And she worked at the newspaper and one night, a woman snowshoed into town to demand that the paper print a retraction because she said her husband had not shot her. Now, Pearl and I have looked and looked to try to find an article of retraction story. We haven't found one. We haven't found the mention. But Eudora told me this, and we've tracked down the friend. We've tracked down the paper. We've tracked down the time. Uh, and uh, so that was the, the spark uh, for this uh, story, but she moved it to Mississippi, uh, to North Mississippi, and we have a piece of news. So what about a piece of news? Anybody want to start us off? What stands out to you in this story? I might read a part of it. Why don't I do that? Let's talk about this passage. Uh, so Lily has found the newspaper, not Lily, Ruby, and a very important distinction. Ruby has found the newspaper. At last, she flung herself onto the floor, back across the newspaper, and looked at length into the fire. It might have been a mirror in the cabin into which she could look deeper and deeper as she pulled her fingers through her hair, trying to see herself and Clyde coming up behind her. Clyde? But of course her husband Clyde was still in the woods. He kept a thick brushwood roof over his whiskey still, and he was mortally afraid of lightning like this and would never go out in it for anything. And then, almost in amazement, she began to comprehend her predicament. It was unlike Clyde to take up a gun and shoot her. She bowed her head toward the heat onto her rosy arms and began to talk and talk to herself. She grew voluble. Even if he heard about the coffee man with a Pontiac car, she did not think he would shoot her. When Clyde would make her blue, she would go out onto the road and some car would slow down if it had a Tennessee license plate, the lucky kind. The chances that she would spend the afternoon in the shed of the, uh, chances were that she would spend the afternoon in the shed of an empty gym. She began to wonder out loud how it would be if Claude shot her in the leg. If he were truly angry, might he shoot her through the heart? 
At once she was imagining herself dying. She would have a nightgown to lie in and a bullet in her heart. Anyone could tell to see her lying there with that deep expression about her mouth how strange and terrible that would be. Underneath a brand new nightgown, her heart would be hurting with every beat, many times more than her toughened skin when Clyde slapped at her. Ruby began to cry softly, the way she would be crying from the extremity of pain. Tears would run down in a little stream over the quilt. Clyde would be standing there above her as he once looked with his wild black hair hanging to his shoulders. He used to be very handsome and strong. He would say, Ruby, I done this to you. She would say, only a whisper, that is the truth, Clyde, you done this to me. Then she would die. Her life would stop right there. She lay silently for a moment, composing her face into a look which would be beautiful, desirable, and dead. <laughs> okay, what about that passage? What about the, what about Ruby here, Harriet? Yeah, I want to talk about Ruby as um, as fiction writer. Uh, you know that she is uh, there. There's the actual relationship uh, of Clyde and Ruby, uh, and I, I, you know, I, she does say um, it was unlike him to shoot her with it. Uh, he's never done that, but he is a kind of depressing partner who is uh, who pokes her with a gun, who is um, uh, says. Uh, What's keeping supper? Don't you talk back to me. Someday I'm going to smack the living devil out of you. Um, and for her part, um, uh, Ruby, um, when she when Clyde would make her blue, um, she would um, uh, go onto the road uh, and uh, chances are she would spend an afternoon in the shed of the empty gin um, uh, so that uh, sexual independence is her retaliation uh, in this relationship. Um, but um, but the fictional Clyde that Ruby creates uh, in this um, uh, imaginative episode that's spurred by the false story um, is something else. Um, uh, the story says that uh, when, when Ruby was still, there was some passivity about her or deception of passivity that was not really passive at all. There was something that never stopped. And that's something I think is imagination. You know, that Ruby is, is uh, uh, riffs on this uh, image. Uh, and um, and uh, there is... Um, uh, she'd have her nightgown on. There'd be a bullet in her heart, uh, and she'd be beautiful, desirable, and dead. And I and I have to point out again that we're again talking about traditional endings for the story of woman. Um, the idea of uh, the two independent women uh, in fiction being um, being uh, beautiful, desirable, and dead. Uh, and um, and and so Ruby's Ruby's version of their story now is a kind of mocking parody. Uh, that is full of um, of the old story, but revoiced with a difference. Um, uh, and it is um, she imagines Clyde's tears of repentance uh, as he admits, "Ruby, I've done this to you." Um, but it's also it's also a story that has an effect uh, on their relationship. Uh, in that, uh, at the end of the story, um, something when she shares the story with Clyde. Uh, something rare and wavering, some possibility stood timidly like a stranger between them uh, and made them hang their heads. Um, uh, that it, it she brings it back to the relationship in a way that is uh, has an effect on it, at least for a moment. Um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, Clyde, Clyde grumbles about her not having dinner ready, but uh, but he is, but he almost chuckles. When he thinks, when he accuses her of hitchhiking, uh, and uh, and he's right, of course, um, uh, that he seems to have accepted her um, her um, uh, um, her finding her pleasure elsewhere, uh, and um, and uh, in Ruby's Ruby's having a lot of fun uh, 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 imagining um, this drama between them, uh, where he cares enough to shoot her. Um, yeah. Yeah, she imagines, she imagines this dramatic scene. She imagines passion in the relationship, caring. And the key moment for her too is when her imagination and his are joined and they both imagine it. 
something it might have been true because Clyde is not an imaginative fellow, but her storytelling, in a sense, brings his imagination. And so you have sort of the relationship between reader and writer, don't you? And right. it's a shared act of imagination uh, there. And then it's gone. Yeah. Pearl. I think of um, Ruby as completely in charge of her own life. Uh, mm -hmm not just writing this story, but it doesn't have to be very blue to go out onto the road. And she fully admits that she's been meeting with this, in this case, the coffee man. Uh, and and she's not worried about that at all. I mean, she has liberty and yeah. he doesn't have to be, he just has to be gone, you know, out of the house as he should be, I suppose. And she can go off and live her own life. And, and she says in the passage that you read, she didn't think that he would shoot her. You know, so then she m imagines this whole thing. And so the ending, to come back to what Harriet and you were saying, um, is very much like in The Wide Net. The woman is in charge. She puts the man in his place. Uh, and then she gets what she wants, a little bit of control. I mean, she has control of that story. And she's making up that story to tell to her husband to get some, get back at him. I mean, I think she's she's really a marvelous character. Yeah. She has it um, in ways. <laughs> It's also the story uh, anticipates in a way, no place for you, my love, where there is this kind of uh, uh, act of imagination uniting uh, characters. Yeah. Anything else? Any? Uh, yeah, Joe Ellen. Whoops, we can't hear you. Sorry, I agree with Pearl for the most part, but um, Ruby does hide the newspaper when Clyde first comes in. And later she makes a conscious decision to share it with him. And so I think that um, she does set up a moment that is, is with him, that she's a little bit more complicated, even though she's very slow. But I'm interested in the narrator here. Um, there's not free and direct discourse exactly. Um, I'm not sure what Welty's establishment of that was um, or sophisticating of its use, but there, she teases us on the first page. The narrator says, what was that she's saying? And then about two thirds down, she tells us that, that the way she, this is the way she was when she amused herself when she was alone. And the narrator also talks about her mouth fell into a deepness, into a look of oh, uncon unconscious cunning. Yeah. But just the use of that word cunning, there are just a number of things here that I find really interesting and uh, in need of some explanation, maybe. Yeah. Charlotte. Um, hi, I'm Charlotte. This is my first time here, and this is great. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, Someone mentioned just a couple minutes ago that this story reminded them of the wide net and the wide net's probably my favorite wealthy story. And I totally agree. Just the imagination and sort of like the anticlimax at the end where they kind of are disconnected again, the two main characters. And I just wanted to point out like a really small detail. Um, but I have the Library of America edition and on page 19, um, Ruby's kind of like looking out at the storm and she sees um, a flash of lightning in the shape of a tree. And I just think it's interesting that like sort of at the peak imaginative moment of this story, there's lightning and a tree. And it's kind of the same thing in the wide net when the storm kind of rolls across the bank and she sees a tree get split by lightning. And that's probably not important, but I just thought it was interesting. I think it is important. In fact, Clyde is afraid of lightning. But here is Ruby, the act of imagination. And Ruby looks into the fire and looking into the fire, it's like a mirror, you know? She's finding herself there. The imaginative act is associated, I think, with the fire in the sky and the fire in the grate uh, as well, yeah. Anything else about a yeah, pearl? Um, Charlotte's comment also makes me think about the tree that falls and kills uh, in a curtain of green. So that, that part's there. And to um, Joellen's comment about the narrator, I guess I would remind us that this is the um, just the second story that's published in a major uh, literary journal. And um, so Lily Daw was published in Prairie Schooner, very you know up and coming journal, important journal. And then this was the first one in Southern Review. So maybe she didn't really have the narrator versus the character versus free and direct discourse. 
completely in hand. I mean, of course, I'm not trying to say she wasn't talented, but just <laughs> so it was, you know, very early, very, very early. Yeah, it's early. It's at a time when she doesn't rework things yeah. as much. Yeah, she tends to uh, to let them go as as written. Yeah, Harriet. So I don't actually have my copy of my book sitting right here with me today, and I and wondered. I wondered. Uh, yes, I know. Terrible, uh, <laughs> Suzanne. Read a little bit of the ending uh, of this story. Um, but I'm thinking about getting from the rare and wavering uh, that happens between them uh, to the fire, um, to the to the newspaper being thrown in the fire. Yeah, I'll read it. Tom. The moment filled. No, she uh, she shows it. She's about to show him the paper. Slowly, they both flush as though with a double shame and a double pleasure. It was as though Clyde might really have killed Ruby and as though Ruby might really have been dead at his hand. Rare and wavering, some possibility stood timidly like a stranger between them and made them hang their heads. Then Clyde walked over in his water-soaked boots and laid the paper on the dying fire. It floated there a moment and then burst into flame. They stood still and watched it burn. The whole room was bright. Look, said Clyde suddenly, it's a Tennessee paper. See, Tennessee, that wasn't none of you it wrote about. He laughed to show that he had been right all the time. It was Ruby Fisher, cried Ruby. My name is Ruby Fisher, she declared passionately to Clyde. Oh, ho, it was another Ruby Fisher in Tennessee, cried her husband. Fool me, huh? Where'd you get that paper? He spanked her good humoredly across her backside. Ruby folded her still trembling hands into her skirt. She stood stooping by the window until everything outside and in was quieted before she went to her supper. It was dark and vague outside. The storm had rolled away to faintness like a wagon crossing a bridge. So what do you make of those last lines, Harriet? Um, well, you know, maybe I think we ought to discuss them. I think that... Um, uh, something is mo it. Something is the, the relationship is the same, and it's also different. Um, and it's maybe only momentarily different. Um, but something has happened between them over this story, and that fi that burst of of fire, uh, flame uh, as he throws the newspaper in, it, it makes me think warmth. Um, makes me think um, that something is. Uh, there's just the it 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 does make me it reminds me very much of the end of the wide net. It reminds me though too of um of um um of um the New Orleans stories of, of yeah yeah, yeah, no place for you, my love um and the possibility of something happening that's just momentary and then gone. Yeah, and it makes the room, the whole room was bright from the paper. Mm -hmm. But then at the end, it was dark and vague outside. The storm had rolled away to faintness like a wagon crossing a bridge. So, G. Bear. Well, it's, um, you know, obviously, you know, a crisis has passed. The storm has gone by. It's gone by like the arc over a bridge. And, um, and and I think they came through a crisis there. Um, she realized that, uh, you know, that's a Tennessee paper from the coffee man. Um, you know, she had done something that in that culture would have resulted in Clyde likely killing her. And Clyde might likely have killed her. And, um, you know, they passed through that crisis. Maybe they approached and both backed off. But it was, um, you know, the symbolism of the storm passing is... Uh, uh, to me, of course, quite a symbol of the um, the crisis that they just got through. And I think Harriet is thinking it here is at least they have this moment that they share together, mm -hmm. a moment of, you know, a passionate, uh, uh, imaginative moment. And then it passes. But maybe, maybe the relationship has changed. But it's vague. It's dark. We're not sure, I think. As typical wealthy, yeah. The crisis has passed. Yeah, Joel and, and then Pearl. And Ruby is looking out the window again. Yeah. She's looking out the window at the beginning, 
throughout and again. And whatever has happened here, which was magical and the kind of fant fantasy thing, um, I find the letdown at the ending just a little just a little sad for her. It's a piece of closure too, but dark and vague outside, um, and she will be out out looking again. But there was, a, I mean, it records a wonderful moment, but yeah. it does seem to me to circle back. And the narrator has noticed her red cracked hands, mm -hmm. so we don't get very much about outside Ruby's imagination or even how old she is. Clyde had wild dark hair and was strong and handsome. And now he's bald and afraid of lightning. How old is, how old is Ruby? How long yeah. has this been going on anyway? I was thinking too, I'm gonna qu quote the last lines of No Place for You Now I Love where the uh, man from Syracuse thinks that uh, he remembered for the first time in years when he was young and brash, a student in New York, and the shriek and horror and unholy smother of the subway had its original meaning for him as the lilt and expectation of love. That to me is so much more hopeful in a way than the ending of yeah. uh, uh, a piece of news, Pearl, and then Jessica. Um, the beauty of reading these stories at the beginning is seeing uh, the tropes and the things that, that Welty liked to use. And then I've never thought of this story in connection with No Place for You, My Love, or with The Wide Net, or any of these other connections that we're making. And it, it's really uh, such a great benefit to read them again now, knowing where she's going to go. And this thought came to me in that paragraph you read about double shame and double pleasure. And then she's calm until the outside and the inside. So we have this double, mm -hmm. these two sides, two masks, um, always working together in Welty. Not always, but often working together. Doubling double again, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Jessica. Oops. We're well, I, I, of course, I'm going to give a wrap up. So Harriet, why don't you go and I'll go after you. Okay, so I was just going to say quickly that, you know, there is uh, another version of Ruby and Clyde uh, in a manuscript that um, uh, I came across in 2014 that looks like it is uh, an attempt of a novel uh, written maybe in 37, 38, uh, where she she's already published the story, but she picks up Ruby and uh, Clyde and and other characters who are in other stories that maybe aren't written yet, um, and um, and in that version um, uh, they have a daughter, uh, and the daughter sits for the artist who is the narrator of the story, uh, who's a painter, uh, and um, she uh, when she uh, disrobes for the for uh, her work as a model, um, uh, Martha Galen sees. Uh, uh, marks on her body and says, "What? what is this? And she says, my father has been beating me. Um, so I'm just picking up the topic of abuse and, and the nature of this relationship and and um, and the complexity of it and also um, uh, back to the idea of Eudora being sort of forced to think about writing novels when she's, when she's what she's great at, what she discovers she's great at is these kind of spare story puzzles uh, that are maybe nine pages long. And the reason she wrote that novel that you're talking about is because she was under pressure. To right, write exactly. Yeah. Let's right. talk next time about why these are the first two stories. Why do you think, why start here? It's a position of such emphasis at the beginning of the book. So we'll, we'll talk about that next time. Jessica, I'm stuck. I'm I just want to thank everybody for coming back. I see so many familiar faces and it's good to see you. Thank you for your comments. Welcome to new people. And we will be back next week discussing Petrified Man, The Key, and Keela, the Outcast Indian Maiden. See you then. Bye. Bye-bye.